Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Graff, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief at National Jeweler. I'm pleased to welcome you to the latest episode of My Next Question, National Jewelers webinar series sponsored by RDI Diamonds. Today's session is hosted by our senior editor, Brecken Brandstrader, and features Dr. Cheatham Lule, a mineralogist, award-winning gemologist, and founder of Illinois-based consulting firm Cabelli LLC. Before I turn it over to Brecken and Cheatham to get started, I just want to let our attendees know that if they have a question, they can type it into the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. I'll be back on at the end of the discussion to facilitate the Q&A. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the National Jeweler website this coming Friday, March 26. Now I'll turn it over to Brecken and Cheatham to get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm so excited to be here today with somebody that I've had the pleasure to hear speak at various GEM events um, many times. So I'm thrilled to have Cheatham here with us today. Um, she's here to talk to us about a very fascinating subject, which is, of course, archaeogemology. But before we get into that, um, Cheatham, I'd love to have you just sort of start by talking a little bit about your experience in the trade, um, the work you do, and you know what you do, especially through your company, Cabela. Thank you, Breck, and um, I very much appreciate the opportunity and such a pleasure to be here because, not because, um, you know, talking to you is great, but also I'm going to talk about something that I'm really passionate about, so it's, it's fun, um, and I, I very much appreciate this opportunity. Um, I've been a gemologist well over 20 years now, almost 25 years. And my background is in geology and uh, mineralogy. So anything about rocks and minerals are my thing, basically. <laughs> and um, I first involved more in uh, academic background because uh, during my master's and PhD, I was, uh, as a, I was a research assistant back in Turkey. And then I moved to England, worked in trade for a while. Then I started working for GI London campus as an instructor okay. and afterwards, uh, about 10 years ago, I moved to the US and worked for Gemworld. Um, and um, I um, developed their uh, educational classes, uh, hands on workshops, and um, did. I, I still do research and writing for them. I'm still their um, helping editor for the Gem Guide. In the meantime, I got involved in um, color projects, both with World of Color at Gemworld and also. Um, uh, color codex with uh, Christopher Smith in New York. Yeah. Um, so um, I do a lot of things. <laughs> yes, you certainly but, do. Uh, <laughs> because anything about gems and, and minerals are, are my passion. And archaeogemology is something um, I call it either my indulgence or, or my very expensive uh, hobby <laughs> because nobody pays me for that. <laughs> right. So I only use my resources. In my daily work at Kibele LLC that I, I set up six years ago, and uh, I, I've been an independent appraiser in the last yeah. few years, my main uh, focus is on uh, mineral appraisals. But I do gem and jewelry appraisals. Okay. And also, uh, I still do um, research and writing. And um, before COVID, obviously, I was heavily involved in traveling and teaching and giving talks and um, since we're locked down, um, trying to do things online, but I believe in hands-on right. education, so it really reduced during the pandemic. Right. But hopefully we will get out and start doing that. In the meantime, um, I have more time to sit down and read my books and delve into archaeogemology a little bit more. Perfect. Well, you certainly are a busy woman. Um, so let's talk about that, this nice little, you know, side project you have of archaeogemology, but let's start at the beginning. So tell us a little bit about um, what exactly you mean when you say archaeogemology. Um, it's actually a, uh, the, the, the easiest way to describe archaeogemology is a multidisciplinary approach. Basically, we take gemology, archaeology, and mineralogy all of these three subjects put together and uh, help each other working with, to, uh, with those um, three areas and uh, bring about not only identification of the antique gems and ancient gems, but also trying to establish the understanding of what they were, what they meant to people and how they were tra traded 
because the moment you understand uh, what we call the country of origin in ancient world, then it actually explains a lot to archeologists in terms of uh, the interactions be between different cultures and civilizations and trade routes and so on. And it's fascinating because okay. in today's work, uh, in, in our modern day, uh, we think that it's easy and people think, oh, it was thousand years ago, it wouldn't move. They moved a bit. <laughs> So understanding right. that is, is great with our geomology and that's what fascinates me. That's so interesting. So it goes well beyond just saying that here's what this stone is, here's where it came from. And it gives you a lot of social aspects of that timing as well. Absolutely. So interesting. So what, what has driven the um, development of archaeogemology? I think it was around a lot of times. Uh, it, it was because of the, you need to think about um, gemstones as commodities. Uh -huh. Whether the commodities as we understand today, or they were, they had a different meaning thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, even eighty-two thousand years ago, because there are actually examples of those too. Uh, what kind of commodities and what kind of meanings they had, we don't know, but they definitely moved around. So uh, that was a good clue for archaeologists, first of all, trying to um, understand those connections. Um, but I think the major example that came about as a typical archaeogemological uh, study was, I think, in the 1930s about lapis lazuli all the way from Afghanistan and used in um, ancient Egypt. And then when you look at that, uh -huh. um, it was never defined as archaeogemology, but that study with the origin started it all. And then um, you can actually look at many other publications in between since then. But I think in the last two decades, people started looking into that a little bit more in depth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how has, how has archaeogemology shifted um, since its outset? I think shifting is more um, related to better developments in mineralogy, you know, less non destructive tests, more yeah. publications more field work with both mineralogists and archeologists coming together. And also there's a very uh, important science called archeometry. So it actually anything um, positive science related with an archeology span that they can use. It could be biology, it could be paleontology. It could be anything that you can imagine that you can apply to archeology span um, brought that back together. So the more people work together, the more technology, that was provided to scientists. Um, and when you think about these kind of gem artifacts from ancient world that you can test them with non-destructive methods and understand where they come from, uh, this made people more interested in uh, archaeogemology for sure. Gotcha, wow, it's so interesting. So I'd love to have you um, sort of talk us through the process that you go through when you're investigating the identity um, and potential source of a gem and then how you tie that into what that means socially, those cultures? Well, process starts going to museums. Okay. <laughs> I love going to museums. <laughs> if you don't like going to museums, then, <laughs> then it, it might be a little tricky. Now, uh, that's how it all started, actually. I didn't even know archaeogemology existed. But um, I go to museums, and, and this is happening 20, 25 years ago when I was a much younger gemologist. And I look at, um, displays on museums and, and everything is defined very well um, in, in um, detail. So mm -hmm. if it's a metal, they tell you exactly what kind of metal and where it came from. If it's a bone uh, item, uh, it is identified about what kind of animal it comes from and the carving styles and so on. And next to it, there's a quartz, there's a garnet, there's something else and it just says stone. Like, okay. <laughs> Everything Where's else there is defined so good right. and well in, in, right. in detail, and yet it's not just a stone, <laughs> you know. Darn it, it's uh, it's quartz, it's it's carnelian. So um, it it prompted the question and asking that, and and now that's what I do. I, I push people. So if it's a garnet, for example, and if you put if they went as far as garnet, I say, so what kind of garnet is that? So you have to yeah. Put it. Um, you know, uh, terminology actually is important because with that, when I started looking at all these things, I realized that the, there's a huge disconnect between certain disciplines that the terminology didn't work. 
So anyway, when you look at those things, oh. you realize that. But what happened was uh, when I started asking these questions, I actually got questions back from uh, archeologists. So how can you uh, identify them? And when I tell them that I can actually identify a gemstone without damaging it, without destruct any destructive tests, then they get excited about it. So uh, then archeologists would start asking questions about it. I could identify the gemstone. Now, it is a if it is a gemstone that is not locally available within that region or in that ex excavation site, then the next question is where it came from. Mm -hmm. So for that, you need to look into the local geology. You need to look into the um, possible geology of, of that material and try to find out what it is. Um, and then the ultimate step, in my opinion, because my, my main goal is mineralogical uh, investigation of the material, to find anything that is similar to that material in an existing setting in the field so that modern samples can be collected. At that point, mineralogy comes in, then we do the both chemical and uh, physical analysis for the um, material, both in modern and in the ancient material and compare them. And if they okay. set uh, or, or match. So, um, and that, that's the process. Whether the prompting comes from a client or a museum mm -hmm. or, or an excavation site, it's one thing, but we start with simple gemological tests, looking into local geology and trying to understand what it is, and then and then trying to make make it fit with something uh, modern that if we could compare it. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. Wow. Interesting. So, um, if it is coming from a client uh, or or some collection, that it is not. Um, uh, confirmed as an archaeological object, I would definitely work with archaeologists first um, to get the um, confirmation, basically. I need authentication because I'm not an archaeologist, so I need to get that item to be authenticated if it is that era and this era, so they right. can uh, tell me, yes, it's not modern, so let's have a look at it. Uh, and then who are you working with past that at the end when you're starting to come to sort of conclusions about what that meant for the time period in terms of trade and? Um, depend, um, depending on the material and what it is. I mean, um, if I'm asked about a turquoise that is from North America, I have to work with that particular uh, geography and the particular um, era that, for example, if it's the North yeah piece. If I'm asked about an engraving, I need to figure out if it's Hellenistic or Roman, um, or if it's an entirely different culture. So um, there, there's so many things that involved and everybody specializes on a certain era or certain style or certain, um, I don't know, time frame yeah. in archaeology, just like, um, you know, just like medicine. You know, not, yeah, you might yeah. call them with your doctor if they have different special yeah. So that that's yeah, that's how it works with them. Okay, so um, I'd love to hear some of your most the some of the past projects that you've worked on, things that have been surprising to you, or some of your favorite. If you can share those with us, to get into some um, surprising. I, I I am proud of a few things that I've done. I mean, I that's not <laughs> me saying that. <laughs> um. One of the things that I love reading about, and, and if people are interested in ancient gems, uh, I'm sure they know about Pliny, Pliny the Elder's mm -hmm. uh, natural history book in 37th uh, volume, talks about gems. And then Sydney Hall, uh, Sydney Ball actually um, translated that particular volume in 1960s. So if you read those, um, either the original translation or Sydney Ball's um, uh, uh, translation because he's a he was a gemologist so it's more on the gemology side uh, you'll realize that Pliny refers to many gemstones and their sources and one of them was very interesting to me because it talks about garnets I, I'm obsessed with garnets so that's, <laughs> let's just make this clear first and uh, my PhD was on garnets and uh, in Pliny's book it says that 
Uh, Almondine, actually, the type locality, what they call, um, comes from Alabanda, an old city, an old Karian city in Western, today's Western Turkey, then it, it was in Hellenistic world. And my uh, PhD thesis actually covered that area because I was looking at the mineralogy of five different garnet occurrences in Western Turkey. And um, in Pliny's book, it says uh, Alabanda is so rich with garnets that even city walls of Alabanda has garnets in them. Oh my God. And most of the historians and, and archeologists just laughed at it because well, of course not, it's just made up uh, information because all garnets came from India and so on. And I happened to be at the field and we're excavating, well, they were excavating it and we were doing our uh, survey. Uh, in the field, and yes, I can show you the photos if you like, actually. Yes, I think we'd, okay. like, we'd love to see um, those, yeah. Just, I, I'm so excited about that. Uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, we're, oh, share screen, here we go. Okay, let me go back to, here. So the, these photos were taken almost 20 years ago. So this uh, photo here is, is uh, Alabanda being excavated at the time. Mm -hmm. It is, it is um, let me show you where it is actually. Yeah, here we are. Um, I mean, this is modern Turkey and mm -hmm. this is Western part of Turkey. And if you just go over there, you'll see this is the old Karian city. Okay. So it, it, we're looking at very old Hellenistic, um, area that, that um, Romans were quite aware of. There were lots of trading going on within that city. And this at the time was being excavated and these are the city walls. As you can imagine, these ancient cities were built from large uh, blocks of rocks. They were local, obviously. They wouldn't carry right. them places. They were right. local city walls and you can see that. This is my advisor actually standing there. You can see how large those blocks are. And then when we looked at those city walls close up, there you are, there's your little garnets. There. And, <laughs> and then we looked at the local rocks and uh, local rocks were indeed full of garnets. Those little uh, red brown pieces uh, were all garnets, all tested. Strangely enough, they were not almond almondine garnets, uh, hmm. but they were there. Um, I could not uh, carry this uh, study through. This this needs a good study, but um, again, uh, uh, archaeogemology is not a um, subject that I could actually get paid to do. I, I need uh, you know funding and time and all that, and I didn't right. have the resources to carry on with this. But there are studies like that. Um, that this one, for example, we have. Um, uh, I think it was in 2009, this was published um, uh, 2010 or 11, I can't remember. And there aren't many um, ancient um, gems or ancient gem related studies published. Um, so this is a very important study in my opinion. There were lots of authors there. I wrote the first chapter. It's all about archaeogemology there. And you can still find this book on Amazon. So if people are interested and within that, I work with another scientist who, are, who is as obsessed as I am with garnets. <laughs> 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 that was another investigation study. This time uh, her um, major focus was in actually the old bacterian uh, culture, which is today's Afghanistan. And there, were, there, there was a large um, collection in the British Museum and there were lots of garnets in them and then we worked on those and the preliminary studies of this um, or, or the results of this study were published in that book as well. So I've done the gemology and gemologically what I have grouped and how I separated them were confirmed with mineralogy. The next step is again uh, working on their geology and where they could be because those sources are completely lost, but we're pretty mm. sure that they are in the uh, area again. So um, that's another one. Um, this is the area in around Hindu Kush mountains. Um, 
the area that um, she was covering at the time. So it's, it's a huge area and there are plenty of garnet resources that you can actually look at. Um, so these are, these are the things that we do. I have another project, hopefully we conclude it soon. Um, I couldn't put anything here because it's still a going on project and uh, right. will be published with uh, Gems and Gemology because I've been uh, hopefully published. I've been working with the GI lab. Uh, for a long time. Very so, cool. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Oh man, we, we got to figure out the wall too. We got to put out like a call now for funding to go back to that wall so you can tell us what it's about. That's so cool. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if there's anybody watching that's an interested in finding out, please contact me. It's <laughs> very, very cool. I love this. Um, I mean, I think I think by now you've talked a little bit about why it's so important, but just to, you know, sort of round it up again, why archaeogemology and, you know, what are the benefits of studying it? What does it mean to us? Benefits is just like in any other multidisciplinary work. We really need to communicate with each other uh, in terms of science. So all these things are happening in gemology. Uh, all, um, you know, you can't ignore what's going on in mineralogy while you're working in gemology science. And, and you can't right. ignore any of these while you're working in archeology span because you're identifying certain things. So this is more of a, a scientific approach, but it, it's really important to understand. For example, most people think that the uh, gem treatments are something new, you know. Uh, we, we, know we have known about them maybe 100, 150 years. It's not the case, you know, there are recipes going back to 1000 years ago to uh, talk about um, heat treatment of ruby. Um, quench crackling uh, quartz is at least 2000 years old practice because we have papyri that actually talks about that. Um, right. Heat treatment of amethyst, uh, turning them into citrine is a well known fact in ancient Roman Jewry. So, um, we really need to understand these things and, and probably widen our horizon a little more as gemologists. That's, that's how I look at it from a gemologist's point of view. From a mineralogist's point of view, well, it's science. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Just study garnets ad nauseum, right? Yeah. Um, what, so you mentioned this a few times, but, you know, it's sort of a, a smaller thing that you have to sort of um, you need, need funding for, and it's not something that you can sort of throw yourself into full time. So for people who might be interested, um, I did want to ask you, you know, if this is something that people could study or pursue, or if they were interested, you know, how would they get into it? Uh, more the merrier. I really need more people coming into this. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, uh, Whatever background they're coming from, I mean, there are people today working in archaeogemology and not all of them are mineralogists, you know, there are plenty of right. archaeologists out there or art historians. Um, so it, it's very important that we have different uh, people coming into the whole um, idea. So, um, first of all, education, you cannot just decide, oh, I just want to identify this and, you know, oh, I saw this quartz in the museum and identified it as amethyst and it's fine, I'm an archaeogemologist. It doesn't work that way. So we really need to pay attention uh, to good education. And um, it, it's not a paid job unless you have a particular position at a university and you can get your funding for this particular study. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's going to pay you to do archaeogemology. So what you need to do is uh, you need to get into um making connections and if you want to actually uh experience what's going on in the field um talk to the local university if there's an archaeology department if they're going into excavations and uh, if you tell them i'm a gemologist i want to actually identify whatever gem material that you are excavating would you let me do that they would love it i've <laughs> never been turned down by anybody like that and now i'm getting invitations so uh, that happens. Um, go to your local museums and talk to people. Maybe curators might be interested in what you're doing. So uh, making inroads to the study is important. Mm -hmm. um, you have to use your own resources. Always remember that. But following publications and, and following up with the education is the key to this. So that's my only um, uh, advice, if there is any. 
Right. And how often, I'm curious, you you mentioned a few times that, you know, people might come to you with private collections. How often does that happen with a piece here or there or that kind of? Depends. How often? I might get a call at least once a month, but how uh, reliable those calls are, collections (laughs) are not, that's that's questionable. Most people... Most people think what they have, um, or they think they have something they want to believe in rather than what they know. Let's put it right. That way. I gotcha. Okay. Um, so once certain things are explained, it's different. Um, do I get more um, really exciting uh, calls? Yes, I do, and uh, it's generally through um, gem people interesting oh. enough some way okay. or the other trade people are a little bit more into this um and of course any uh university project or excavation project is good um and excavation projects are generally a summer thing so i get that once a year um if i can yeah. to travel and do that i would do that yeah. um, but um those academic studies take years anyway right um, so frequency depending on the project right Okay, great. Um, well, before we go see if we have any audience questions, um, I know you had a slide with your information on it. Oh, Did yeah. you do you want to throw that up for anybody who might be interested yeah. in contacting Cheatham? There you go. Chat with her about archaeogemology or garnets, I suspect is the way to her heart. So there you are. Um, Michelle, I'd like to go and throw it over if we have any uh, audience questions for Cheatham today. Okay. Uh, thanks, Brecken and Cheatham. That was a really interesting discussion. And I, there are some questions. We're going to get to those in a minute. Uh, thanks again to our sponsor, RDI Diamonds. As a reminder to our uh, listeners, you can still type questions in the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And I'll try to get to as many as possible. We had some sub submitted beforehand as well. Uh, I'm going to give people a couple minutes to put any questions in. And I'm just going to say a quick word about RDI Diamonds. RDI Diamonds, the selection you want, the quality you need. Thousands of diamonds, that's just the beginning. RDI offers a wide range of services and support to help you succeed, from Flexima Memo Options, a partnership with De Beers Group Industry Services, to generous stock options and cost-efficient shipping. RDI's goal is to provide the highest quality of both care and diamonds to your store. Visit rdidiamonds.com today to learn more. Now let's move on to our listener questions. Um, one that came in during the course of the webinar here, uh, somebody, one of our guests wants to know, Cheatham, are there any books in particular that you would su- could suggest on this topic? And there are many wants books. to know, there's a kind of general two requests for written materials. Someone else wants to know which publications would you recommend that we read and or follow? So books and then publications or social media accounts, that kind of thing. Well, um, there are many books, but there isn't a single book on archaeogemology. It's, it's waiting to be written. So <laughs> I think you seem like a, the likely author now. And if you need an editor, yeah, Brecken that's, that's and I nice could, say. could I'm, help. I'm honored. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm qualified for that, to be honest. Um, there are books. I would definitely recommend people starting with Pliny's books. Um, there are lots of books that are translated from ancient texts. Um, so you can look into that. And uh, strangely enough, because these books are really, really old, you can actually find them on Google Books as PDFs. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was not- just going to ask that because I'm I'm I don't know that you can go to your local bookstore and ask for a plenty book. <laughs> uh, no, you can you can buy it on Amazon. There are lots of you know modern English translations to them. Um, but also you can find lots of uh, old uh, gemstone books are written because they always uh, refer to old uh, lores. If you actually don't mind, I'm just going to grab a few from my library and I can show them to you on the screen. No, that's fine. That's fine. We have a lot more questions coming in here. Bracken, I think I just roped us in a new job. How do you feel about that? You, I'm 100% okay with it. I think that would be great. <laughs> it's so interesting. I did see that we had somebody comment on um, reading some of the books right now, reading their way through some of the Oh, yes, yes. We had, right we had a listener uh, on that the right said track. that she was reading several volumes right now. Cheatham is back with her books. Okay, so um, this is actually um, Sidney Ball's translation of um, Pliny's 37th volume. 
Can you hold that a little bit? Uh, sure. Cheatham, actually, do you want to quit sharing your screen so we can see you in the- uh, Sure, yeah, the, sorry. So people can see that a little bit better. Yeah, hold a little closer yeah. there so people can take a peek. Okay, very nice, thank you. Okay, oh, I like the so um, this, is, um, this is something that I can actually find at the um, antique bookstores, online bookstores, um, quite an investment. Um, it's not, you know, it's not the cheap thing to buy, but if you read into it, then it's worth the effort. Uh, my other very favorite book is actually Theophrastus on Stones. This is, uh, this was translated from ancient Greek in 1950s by two chemists. And this is known to be the oldest text, surviving oldest text um, about gemstones today. In fact, it's all that Pliny referred to this book because it was about yeah. 300 years prior to his time. Oh, wow. So that's another one, highly recommended. Very cool, good? thank you, yes. Okay, and my other one, um, I, I really love reading time to time, it's um, Arab Roots of Gemology. Okay. And uh, this one is interesting because this is talking about 13th century Arab trades, um, Arabian trades of ge gemstones. And um, you can actually tell all sorts of different things. And there are um, pricing information in it. How much you would be paying for a garnet or a ruby in the 13th century? <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. That is that's, cool. that's really a cool thing. Um, this one, I just thought of another book. I'll be, I'll be back with that once this is okay. <laughs> it's okay. I think we're good on that. If you want okay, to get one let me more. just go and grab one more. Ooh, I want to read that one. Reckon, do you I... have uh, Cheatham's um, Instagram handle? Yes, I can go find that if you'd like me to drop it yeah, in. Can that. you drop it in then so people can follow her? Because I think someone is asking um, for, for publications we can read and or follow. So I feel like if you're going to follow someone on Archaea Gemology, I think Cheatham is your best bet. It doesn't sound like there are a ton of kind of modern people doing this that would have Instagram accounts or whatnot. Right. This one is a translation, not the best translation, but... Um, this is Al Bruni, who was a Persian polymath, as we call them. Um, he was the first scientist calculated the uh, specific gravity of metals. And he had interest in gemstones. And, and the way that he wrote about them is really, really interesting too, because this is the first time of that era in medieval um, times that was a very nice, um, um, scientific approach. So that's another book that I would strongly recommend if you're interested in such things. But when it comes to publications, again, you really need to be open about, uh, you, you, keep, you keep searching them. You know, somebody might tag it as archaeogemology or somebody might tag it as ancient gems and so on. Um, excavation reports might reveal certain things, but there isn't a particular publication that I can tell you, unfortunately. So, um, and these are these are not the books that I am, um, you know, limited to. These are just what I have in hand right now. Again, Pliny, first and you know, first and uh, foremost to go for. Um, and. Um, I've written some articles, some are um, just for the trade um, magazines. I've written something at um, the Gem Guide. Um, it was about uh, intro to archaeogemology. You can have a look at that too. Um, obviously, I showed you the book um, that uh, was published at the British Museum that was there. Um, I have actually published a few art articles at um, WJA, uh, Women Jewelers Association's uh, newsletter, uh, one article on uh, ancient gem treatments, the other one was on um, garnets, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
and I think one more, I can't remember what it was. Oh yeah, there was one particular ancient um, antique sapphire that I, I wrote a book about. Um, that's in a private collection right now. It's, it's quite fascinating. Um, what else? Um, yeah, just unfortunately you have to be kind of filtering the information yourself. So that's, that's all I, I can say right now. Well, that was a lot. I feel like that was a lot of resources. Um, so I, there's a question that came in about um, uh, gemstone treatments. And I thought this was a fascinating part of the discussion too. So uh, someone said that, I read they were even heat, heat treating red ochre may, many thousands of years ago. Could Cheatham say anything about it? And um, another question was, um, were they treating, I would assume they were treating gems for the same reason we treat gems today because they wanted them to be a different color, a different clarity. Um, yes and no. Ochre, uh, human beings discovered what iron oxides can do with heat for a very uh, long, long time ago. Not even before they actually settled as uh, civilizations and so on. Ochre is one of them. But the purpose was always making them practical, making them useful for their daily lives. You know, uh, I've read articles about ochre being used as a sunscreen, for example, because they were out about in, um, you know, very uh, strong sun. Uh, and so on, uh, and they definitely use red. There are um, articles written about that. You can have a look at it. My very first encounter of any stone treatment, I wouldn't say gemstone treatment, but a stone treatment was in actually uh, Theophrastus's book. He talks about a particular nation living in one of the small uh, islands in Aegean Sea and uh, they have a porous stone and they treat that stone with oil and heat it so that the pores are all filled so that they can carve the stones in, make them into kitchen utensils. So I would say that the treatments started for practical use. And I, I listened to archeologists talking about um, certain chalcedony and so on being treated in order to make them harder or in order to make them a little bit more um, tougher to uh, use them better when they are carving and uh, so on because it was important for bead mating, making. Within the process, they discovered the color, maybe, I don't know, we can only speculate. I, I can't speculate on that too much, but yes, I think everything that we know today was tried many, many thousands of years ago, probably for different reasons and, and ended up with different things. Just like today, remember, I mean, nobody started producing synthetic diamonds for gemstones. It all started being produced for industrial use. So same thing. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And, you know, if they had a limited, I mean, today we have all kinds of materials to make our utensils from and whatnot, but they were only working with what they could find back then. So they had mm -hmm. to figure out a way to make it work. And they did. Mm -hmm. um, someone else wanted to know, um, when a crystal is lodged in a wall, how does it get identified as a specific garnet type? For instance, how does one determine that Pliny's supp supposition of almondine was incorrect? Oh, uh, we use spectroscopy and, and for gemologists, it's very easy. You can actually use the reflected light with your uh, handheld spectrum. It's, it's not a difficult thing to do. Also, you can use today handheld uh, Raman spectroscopy and so on. So I've also collected hundreds of specimens for uh, chemical analysis from the area too. So we, we know that it's an almondine. <laughs> so, um, but other than that, um, Garnets are very complicated minerals. There isn't a single pure garnet. We always refer to a solid solution series in mineralogy and gemology. Uh, but luckily, because they are colored with certain elements that we can detect with very basic analysis, we can use our um, handheld spectroscope to identify most of the garnets very easily without even removing it from a wall or a jewelry or anything. Okay. Very cool, thank you. Um, someone wants to know, what is your right hand ring? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> I'm gonna go with Garnet. 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 <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's one of, probably my, one of my most favorite piece of jewelry. Um, it's a very large Hessenite Garnet and um, 
a very talented uh, jeweler in Istanbul created the ring for me because I've always imagined that uh, sitting on a diamond flames and that's exactly what he did. <laughs> That's very cool. beautiful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for sharing that with us. As someone else wanted to know about the intersection of um, how do the studies of religion, mythology, and philosophy, how do those intersect with archaeogemology? Actually, we look at it a lot. I mean, every time I look at something um, in terms of archaeogemological research, uh, I always look at the lore behind it. So for that reason, um, Kunz's, uh, you know, Lore of Gemstones is a very good book read too, because um, you, I, I really want. I, I, what's driven me in anything I do is curiosity. It hasn't killed me yet, but um, <laughs> I just get too curious about everything, and I don't like superficial information. I really want to know why that garnet versus this garnet was used in that particular era and in that particular jewelry why certain blue stones are not seen in one culture and not the other. You know, there's so many reasons. And when you look at it with mythology and history and so on, you will find certain answers there. Again, um, there, is a, there is a limit. And also one thing that I'm really careful about, I really don't like to mix what I know to what I believe. Um, so reading and, and uh explaining what the beliefs were versus what we know exactly is important to me. So the, the differentiation is, is uh, scientists work that when, when you publish, when you explain things, when you give a talk, what you believe in, what you think the other people's beliefs should not interfere with what we know as a fact. So we use everything. It's, it's good to read and interpret everything as much as possible. I hope it answers the question. But. No, I think, yeah, I think that answers the question really well. Um, do you have a favorite museum for gems? Is there one place you think of looking to go? And when you think about w wanting to see a great gemstone collection, I mean, it may be not even one museum, maybe multiple, but what museum or museums do you think just have outstanding gemstone collections? Uh, there are a few. Uh, one, um, I did a lot of volunteer work at uh, Natural History Museum in London. Uh, they have an amazing collection of gemstones because it's a very old museum. Obviously, Smithsonian is one of the best in the whole world. Um, I think my heart beats really, really fast when I go to the um, Topkapı Palace Museum in Istanbul because the Ottoman treasury has the largest and the most beautiful emeralds in the world. Uh, that is open to public, uh, and I'm not even an emerald person, so you can you can take it from there. But if you see a big throne that is covered by peridot, it, it, I cannot imagine anybody not getting excited about it. Um, another one that I haven't been to, but I'm dying to go, is the Hermitage Museum in Saint Petersburg. Um, I I heard so much about it, I've read so much about it, but I couldn't make it. Uh, and I'm sure there are many other museums um, to be seen, but those three are at least because I've seen and I could go there and go to those places like millions, time, millions of times right. and stay there. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'll definitely add those to our list if we haven't visited already. Um, well, we're uh, almost out of time here. And we also, that was all of our questions. So I want to thank again, thanks again, Cheatham for joining us today. And Bracken, thank you so much for hosting. My next question will return next Tuesday. That's March 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Our guest will be Stephanie Gottlieb, the founder and designer of Stephanie Gottlieb. She'll be chatting with our senior editor of fashion, Ashley Davis, about jewelry trends, marketing on multiple platforms, and how to modernize sell selling practices without sacrificing knowledge and customer service. And you can re register for that on our website. And I've just dropped that link into a chat. Thank you so much both for uh, being with us today. Everyone really enjoyed it. And everyone take care and have a great week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Cheetah. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye.